When I wake up, well, I know I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be the man who sees an epic view. When I go out, yeah, I know I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be the man who adventures through and through. And I would drive 5,000 miles. And I would drive 5,000 more. Just to be the man who would drive 5,000 miles to enjoy life some more. I'm not going to do the da 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 part. Yes, I did just totally defile the popular late 80s song, and you're going to be wandering aimlessly for 5,000 miles if you don't plan out your overlanding adventures. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is Overland Trip Planning 101. I'll be your instructor this semester. I don't have syllabus or any required textbooks, but hit that subscribe button down here as your first assignment. My name is Roger. Attention spans are short these days, so you don't care about that. Let's just get started. Planning an overland adventure to somewhere you've never been can be a lot of work, and it can take quite a bit of time to do. I wish there was some kind of cheat code or like a AI assistant. Hey, Overland out. Yes, Roger. King of the Andals, the Roiner, and the first man, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, I want to explore Utah for seven days. Plan that trip for me. Okay, done. Sweet. Unfortunately, that hasn't been invented yet. Someone smarter than me should make that app though and then give me a free lifetime subscription for the idea. Anyways, let's look at all the things that I do right now to plan for an overlanding adventure. Rather than just showing you some random stuff on trips I've planned in the past, let's plan a brand new adventure together. One that I'm actually going to do in the future. In my first ever YouTube video, I shared a story about going to Crater Lake, Oregon. Well trying to go to Crater Lake, Oregon, just to run away from wildfires for a day and a half, sleep in a Walmart parking lot, and come right back home. Well, it's redemption time, and I'm gonna show you all the steps I'm gonna take to plan this future trip based on everything that I've learned since that big Oregon fail. If you haven't seen the How to Start Overlanding Guide or the What I Love and Hate About My Overlanding Gear video, be sure to check those out by clicking the link up here. A quick disclaimer before we start. This is a long video, but it's one that I think brings good value to people who are just getting started with overlanding. And if you're not interested in a particular section, just skip ahead using the chapter markers below and completely offend me that you're not watching every single second of my blood, sweat, and tears. <gasps> Tip number one for overland trip planning. If you're planning out your very, very first overlanding adventure, don't try to plan out some long, epic, once in a lifetime adventure, thinking you're like Indiana Jones or Magellan or something. Stick to something relatively near civilization in case something goes sideways and make it a shorter trip. Okey dokey, Dr. Jones. You don't go running a double black diamond the first time you go out skiing or snowboarding, right? Holy! I'll review all of the tips that I give at the end of the video, so don't worry about taking notes or anything like that. And as always, I'm going to put links for everything that's pertinent down in the video description below. Okay, so Crater Lake is a pretty decent drive from where I live, roughly 450 miles or so, and Google Maps says it'll take about seven and a half hours of non-stop driving. So with a lunch stop, potty breaks, refueling stops, let's conservatively call that nine hours on the road. Tip number two, unless you and your adventuring party are very, very accustomed to long drives, don't try to drive like 12 hours in one shot. It's not a great idea. Everyone's gonna be tired and nobody's gonna have a good time. Been there, done that. So split those drives up into a second day if you have to. Also along that topic, stay hydrated during long drives. I know I used to limit my water intake on long drives to avoid taking so many potty breaks. Man, I'm pretty thirsty. Oh, I better not. I wanna make good time. I don't wanna have to stop and pee. I'm pretty thirsty. Being dehydrated at the beginning of your trip is just plain silly. A good thing to pay attention to while you're just mapping out how to get to where you're going is to see if there are any long stretches where there are no gas stations. I know there's areas of Nevada and Utah where you can go for quite a while before seeing another gas station, and I'm sure there are other areas like that all over the U.S. I miscalculated going through eastern Utah one time to Colorado and had to use my roto packs to make it to the next fuel stop. So yeah, I didn't intentionally stop in this spot to take photos, but Instagram thinks I did. Tip number three, know where you can refuel. Not just on the long highway drives, but while you're out adventuring in the backcountry, know where you can find gas or diesel when you need it. Also, carrying extra fuel is never a bad idea. I'll talk more in depth about tip three when we start looking at stuff to do around Crater Lake. My truck fully loaded with overlanding gear only averages about 13 miles a gallon on long trips. So let's use Google Maps to check for gas stations along the route to Crater Lake. I use either Apple Maps or Google Maps when I'm in the truck for basic point-to-point -point highway navigation but I keep all pertinent mapping information in Gaia. We'll be using the web version of Google Maps for general info and both Gaia GPS on the web and the Gaia GPS iOS app in this video. I'm pretty sure Gaia works the same on Androids for you Android people. We'll be using some other resources as well, 
but I'll talk more about those when we need to use them. And it looks like there are plenty of gas stations on the way, so I don't really have to worry about that. Tip number four, go and download Gaia GPS if you haven't already. And having paper maps as a backup is a smart idea. I have no affiliation with Gaia, but it's a powerful tool that only requires the mobile device that you're probably watching this video on right now, and a membership fee to use the offline mapping feature. There are dedicated offline GPS mapping devices that are extremely powerful, but I've yet to find the need for one. Is Gaia the only thing I use? Heck no. Two is one and one is none. I use the Onyx off-road app sometimes on well-known trails, and the Overland Bound 1 app has a lot of mapping and planning features. And lastly, the emergency satellite comms Garmin InReach mini device that I use pairs with their EarthMate app that also has mapping features. So I essentially have two GPS receivers, because you never know. Even my aftermarket stereo head unit has a GPS receiver and navigation on it too. Yeah, I know your fancy new cars already have that stuff built in, but the old gal's gotta keep up with the times, right? You get where I'm going with this though, backup on top of backup on top of backup. You will never hear me use the phrase over prepared. As you're going to see in this video, I do all planning and the majority of my no cell service and off-road navigation with Gaia. If you already know how to use Gaia GPS, feel free to skip ahead using the chapter marks. One of the first things we want to look at in Gaia to understand how to use it is map layers. And Gaia has a lot of available layers. You can choose whether you want to be streamlined t-shirt and shorts, or if you want to be looking like Joey Tribbiani from that one episode of Friends. Could I be using any more layers? Let me show you the primary layers that I use for overlanding, and it's not a lot. Back in May of 2022, Gaia unveiled a new map layer called Gaia Overland, and that basically replaced five layers that I was previously using, so that's pretty sweet. Here's how you add a new map layer, and remove one. You can also adjust the opacity of each layer to suit your needs. All right, now I'm gonna show you how to create waypoints in Gaia using the web version first and then in the app. So we're gonna mark some gas stations that are close to Crater Lake. So first I'm gonna copy the coordinates from a gas station from Google Maps and paste that into the search bar in Gaia. And that gives me an approximate location where that gas station was. And I'm just gonna mark exactly where it is. I'm gonna hit save waypoint. And then I'm gonna rename it to gas, just so I know what it is. And I'm gonna look for that fuel icon so that they change it into like a fuel pump looking icon. You can also change the color of the icon as well. Where is that guy? This is like playing Where's Waldo. I bet you guys saw it and I didn't, right? All right, let's just use the search bar. Okay, it didn't come up with gas, so I'm gonna type fuel. There she is. And then I'm gonna hit save. So that created the gas waypoint for us. And I'm gonna change the folder and put it into a new folder that we're going to call Crater Lake. No, I changed my mind. Let's just call it Oregon. And I'll show you why I do that later. All right, let me show you one more time and we're going to mark another gas station. So we'll pick this guy here, Sand Creek Station. And same thing, I'm gonna click an area right around that just to get the GPS coordinates in Google Maps. And copy that. Man, I suck at copying stuff, I guess. There we go. And paste it into the search bar again. And we're pretty close to the gas station, so let's mark the exact spot now. There it is. And we'll hit save waypoint again and rename it to gas. Use that fuel icon and hit save. And then we'll put it in the Oregon folder again. 
All right, now let's take a look at how to create a waypoint in the mobile app. So I'm gonna zoom in and literally put my finger where I wanna mark a location. And we're gonna choose the fuel icon again. And then rename this. And I'm just gonna call it gas again. Before I hit save, I'm gonna hit choose folder. And we're gonna find that Oregon folder. There it is, we hit back. And then I hit save in the top right corner. And that's how to create a waypoint in the app. Now that we've got some gas stations mapped out, let's take a look at where we're gonna be able to find a camp for the night. Crater Lake is a national park, so there's gonna be a lot of information available. And the first place I'm gonna look is the National Park Service website. Typically, I check the MPS website a few times as the trip departure date draws closer because it's a great resource for anything happening at the park that may affect your trip. The current alerts at the top here don't affect me right now, but checking some basic camping info would be good. I think all national parks have designated established campgrounds, but I want to avoid those as much as possible, so I'm going to look at something else here. I'm going to go to basic information and then permits and reservations. So here we have some general information like backcountry permits, special use permits. So I'm going to click backcountry permit. And here we got more links depending on what season it is. And I'm probably going during the summer, so let's click on that. And here we have another link for dispersed camping in the summer. So right here we see that you have to be at least one mile from any maintained road or developed area in Crater Lake National Park in order to do dispersed camping. So that's useful, but pretty limited information, particularly with dispersed camping for overlanding. So let's take a look at a couple other resources that I've used before to help us find known dispersed camping locations. Doesn't mean that we're gonna stay in those spots, but it'd be good to mark a few like backups just in case it's running late and we just don't feel like searching for that perfect epic spot anymore. Tip number five, and you probably already know what I'm gonna say, subscribe down there. Kidding, but not. Did you turn in your assignment at the beginning of this video? All right, seriously though. Tip number five, use multiple resources for camping information. One of the obvious ones is, well, Google. There's a couple terms people use for the type of camping I like to do. Dispersed camping, free camping, boondocking, wild camping. There's probably more, but those are the most common. So if we Google Crater Lake dispersed camping, we'll get several results. You can really go down a rabbit hole using Google though, so I'm just gonna show you three websites that have been consistently useful for me. FreeCampsites.net, BoondockersBible.com, and Campendium.com. Some of the camping information is gonna overlap from resource to resource, but that's a good thing when you're marking potential or backup camping locations, because you know that it's gonna be a reliable spot, unless it's already occupied, of course, by somebody else. For areas that don't have any sites that other people have marked, or even if they have marked a spot, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's public land so that you're legally able to camp there. And you can do that by using Gaia map layers that show public land borders, like the overland layer. So I'm gonna mark a few locations in Gaia real quick. And while I'm marking camping locations in the immediate Crater Lake area, I'm also gonna look up gas stations, grocery stores, and propane exchange locations and mark those as well. And again, I just use Google Maps for that stuff. Okay, this is totally off topic here, but I don't know how many of you have been noticing this. Like, what the what are these ads here? Like, I can't make this up. So that's tip number six. Create waypoints for resupply locations. If you were asked in the comments in another video what I do for planning out vehicle fuel when out in the backcountry, I religiously mark gas stations in Gaia. I mentioned earlier about creating waypoints for gas stations, but for me, it's critical that I know where I can refuel when needed. It can be difficult to estimate fuel consumption out on the trails. With elevation changes, the overall speed you travel at is gonna vary a lot based on road conditions, strong headwinds will affect that, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I mark a lot of gas stations, and then I compare those locations to the general backcountry route I'm taking. If you mark a fuel spot in a very remote looking area like there's nothing else nearby, it's a good idea to give them a phone call ahead of time to ensure that it's actually open and that they haven't ran out of fuel. I also treat grocery stores, propane exchange and refill locations, water sources, and potential campsites the same as fuel stops. Mark them down now before you get stuck in a bad situation. All right, so I went ahead and marked some campsites, gas stations, grocery stores, and propane exchange locations in the Crater Lake vicinity. 
ultimately, there's no big secret to finding dispersed camping spots. I know that's not really what you want to hear, but all you really need to know is what is public land and what is not. The Gaia Overland layer will show you public land borders if you zoom in. As long as it's national forest land or BLM land, you're basically good to go, as long as there aren't any signs posted saying no camping, or you're not trying to park in the middle of the trail. And rangers always seem to know some of the best secret spots, so swing by the ranger station and ask them for some tips. Also, don't drive your vehicle onto areas where they don't belong. Leave no trace. Mother Nature doesn't ask for too much in return. Just your respect. Exploring technically means traveling through an unknown location and learning more about it. It doesn't mean let's head off yonder and see what happens. We're not Lewis and Clark. So tip number seven, mark some of the places you wanna see. So the obvious attraction in this trip is Crater Lake itself, right? But I'm sure there are plenty of other beautiful spots in that area. I just don't know any off the top of my head. So mark whatever you wanna see. And keep in mind that it's okay if you don't see everything that you mark, it's just another reason to go back another time. So I'm gonna to try to look for some cool spots for us and mark them down in Gaia. So I save waypoints for two spots that I'm interested in visiting. Pinnacles Overlook and the Pumice Desert. I also found out that BDR, Backcountry Discovery Routes, is mapping out a new BDR track in Oregon that'll be ready by February. So I'll definitely check out their route details when it's available. But for now, I found the Oregon section of what's called the Pacific Crest Overland Route, or PCOR for short. I'm gonna call it PCOR to make it simple from here on out. Tip number eight, look for backcountry routes that have already been mapped out by other people and use their data to help you plan a grand overlanding adventure. A lot of the work has been done for you with those backcountry overland routes. All you need to know is to figure out what portion of the route you have time for. The PCOR runs from the border of Canada all the way down to the border of Mexico, and it follows a similar path to the famous hiking trail, the Pacific Crest Trail. The PCOR uses dirt roads and trails whenever possible, and it'll remind you of just how much backcountry there is in the western coastal states. I downloaded what's called a KML file for the Oregon section of the PCOR. I'll put a link for that down in the description. And that file can be imported into Gaia GPS, which will show a navigable route in Gaia for us to follow. I won't be able to run the entire Oregon section of the PCOR, but we sure can do a part of it on this trip. Before I show you how to import that file, let's take a look at another app that I use that'll help us find some more off-roading trips. The Onyx off-road app is great for, well, as the name suggests, off-roading. It's got built-in data for off-road trails of all sorts, ranging from dirt bike trails all the way up to full-width 4x4 trails and dirt roads. Featured trails, marked by a blue icon on the map, will show some useful trail information like difficulty rating, distance, elevation, and some photos. If you don't know where to find some dirt, Onyx is a great resource to use. Just like Gaia GPS though, the offline mapping feature requires a membership fee. I'm not saying you have to have it, but it's a convenient resource to use for off-road trails. Before we import that KML file we downloaded, let's take a look at some of the other features of Gaia GPS. At the top left, you have a little icon with four arrows. And if you click that, it just hides the menu bar. Click it again, and the menu bar reappears. To the right of that is a little target reticle looking icon, and if you click that, it will locate you on the map. And next to that is the plus icon, which accesses all these features, including import file, we'll come back to that. And lastly, the little stack looking icon on the right is gonna access all the map layers and the map overlay features. To remove a layer, you just click the little red X in the top left corner of each one, and to add them back in, just click that green arrow in the top left corner. If you click Map Overlay, you'll be able to see all the features that you can turn on and off based on your needs. And finally, at the bottom here is the Add Map Layer button. And if you click that, you'll be able to add any map layers that you don't already have in that list above. Near the top left of the screen, you'll see a green button that says Record. You hit that, and that starts recording a track. And I'm not moving right now, so it's not doing anything. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this track. And next to that is a camera button, which lets you take pictures. You can add those to your waypoints. And then the other three black boxes you see to the right of that display different types of information. So if you hold your finger on one of those or the record and camera button, you can change what feature shows up in that area of the screen. And just below those information boxes is your current heading. Right now, I'm going west. Oh, nope, I'm gonna go north. Mm, maybe not, I'm just gonna go northwest, I guess. 
Down at the bottom, you already know we're on the map. And if you hit trip, it's basically the same thing as hitting that green record button I have at the top left there. To the right of that is the search function, which will let you look for some basic things like well-known trails and landmarks. It won't let you look for anything like stores or gas stations, but I heard a rumor that might be coming soon. And next to that, you can manage all of your saved data. So all your folders that you create, all of your waypoints, your saved maps, everything is in there. So earlier we created that Oregon folder, and if you click the little eye icon, you can hide everything that's in that folder and then turn it back on when you need it. If you click that top left, you'll be able to filter what saved data you want to see. And lastly, that little gear icon on the right is just your settings. Okay, now let's click on that plus icon at the top and we're gonna import that KML file. Click import file near the bottom there. And I don't actually have the file on my phone, but that's how you would do it. So just click on the file and it'll guide you through the rest of it. All right, let's go back to the web version of Gaia. Now let's actually import that PCOR KML file. So I'm gonna click on import data near the bottom of that list on the left. So those are the type of files that you can import into Gaia. You can also drag the file directly onto the desktop to import it, but I'm going to hit select files. And just select that file that we have. And now you see a big list of all the data that's in that file. You got some roots right there, and you got some waypoints in there too. So I'm going to save all 28 items and that's gonna start importing that file into your Gaia. And as soon as it's done, it's gonna display the whole route and all the waypoints and any other data that it has in it. And I'm gonna rename that just so it's easier for me to understand. And I'm gonna call it Oregon PCOR and hit save. And we'll also drop all of that data into the Oregon folder too. Okay, now that that's done, we're going to go ahead and click back to get back to the big list of all of our saved items. And same as on the app, if you click that little eye, it'll hide everything that's in that Oregon folder. Click it again and everything pops right back up for you. All right, now let's zoom in and see how close that route gets to everything we've marked so far. So let's take a look at those two places I want to visit which are the Pumice Desert and Pinnacles Overlook. And you can see they're close to the route, but not quite on it. So what we're gonna do now is create little offshoots, like kind of like detours that'll lead us to those spots. Like maybe from here to the Pumice Desert and then around the lake to the Pinnacles Overlook. And then we'll connect it back to the PCOR route. Okay, so we're gonna click Roots on the left there. And you'll get a little pop-up with all the keyboard shortcuts if you want to remember those. Now let's give our route a name. Let's call it Crater... No... Let's call it PCOR Crater Lake Detour. And we can change the color of that route too. Let's make this a happy little orange route. Okay, so let's start our route. We're going to click where we want to start it. And let's go ahead and pick that entrance station right there. And then we'll drop another point at the Pumice Desert. And as you can see, it's gonna try to trace the route as best as it can on its own automatically. Sometimes it's hit or miss though. So shorter segments are usually better. And we're just gonna keep following the road around Crater Lake until we get all the way down to that Pinnacles Overlook area. And again, just take your time, especially with the windy roads, because the system will get confused sometimes and follow a path that you don't necessarily want to take. All right, so now that we're all the way down at the Pinnacles Overlook, You'll notice if you look real close that the route you drew has directional arrows. Near the bottom of the screen you see a little menu bar that gives you some automatic actions that you can take, like doing an out and back route or reroute to the beginning, things like that. Uh, we're going to do it manually, so we're going to kind of retrace part of that route, 
except that we're going to continue west to link back up with the PCOR route. That way we're headed towards these campsites that I got marked over here. So let's go ahead and finish this route that we're making. So you see when I clicked right there, it kind of takes you on that dirt trail that I may or may not want to go on. So we're going to fix that. Let's just delete that last point that we did. And again, we'll just take it one tiny baby step at a time until it traces the path that we actually want. All right, and that's our route. Now, as you're clicking around the map, make sure you're not dragging one of these uh, points on the route. Otherwise, you're going to screw up your route. So I'm going to undo what I just did there. And from there, we can kind of lead ourselves back to the PCOR route. All right, now that our route is all drawn and we've already named it and picked out a happy orange color that we like, let's go ahead and save it. Now that it's saved, I am going to put it in to the Oregon PCOR folder. And that's it. That's how you draw a route on the web version. Now let's go to the app. So I usually do everything in the web version. I'll only use the app when I absolutely have to to draw a route because it's a little more cumbersome. But here's how to do it. And I'm just gonna make a fake route just to show you how to do it. So we're gonna click the plus icon near the top and then click create route. And you'll see a little blue dot that you can move around. So that's gonna be your starting point. And we'll drop that here at this gas station. And then let me zoom out a little bit to see where I want to go. So let's kind of just go up to that general vicinity, kind of by that lake there. And I'm going to put my finger down on another point and hold it until it creates another blue dot. And it'll trace a line just like it did in the web version. Pick our next point. It'll trace another line. That's not the path I want to take though. So let's move some dots around. So I'm going to move that dot and now it follows the path that I actually want to take. So it's basically the same process as in the web version. I just prefer to do it on a computer versus the mobile app just because I have more screen real estate to work with. And then if you want to save the route, all you do is click that word save at the top right corner there. You can choose a folder, change the color, all that good stuff, just like in the web version. And I'm gonna call this root example. And then save it. And since we don't really need that root, let me show you how to delete one now. So if we click the saved icon at the bottom there. You're going to see right now just folders because I have it filtered by folders. So we'll change that up in the top left and we'll pick roots instead. And you'll see all the roots that are in there. We're going to select root example. Tap delete and delete once more. And now it's gone. So the point of the roots is to help you navigate. And it's not like a Google Maps or Waze or Apple Maps or whatever where you get turn by turn directions when you're in the backcountry. Um, you do in the city, I think, but it definitely helps to keep you on track rather than having to look back and forth on the map all the time. So here's how to access the guide me feature. I'm going to go ahead and tap on that happy orange route that we made. And you'll see the actual route file. And then if you click more, you can find guide me. Now, right now it's going to try to guide me from where I'm currently located all the way in San Jose, California. But once you're near that route, it'll be pretty self-explanatory. There's also a pop-up that asks if you wanna start recording a track and that's up to you if you wanna do it or not. So we've got a bunch of waypoints marked and we found that pretty awesome PCOR route that we're gonna follow. So I think what I wanna do on this trip is to start in the north actually, right around that area and then work my way back down south to go home. So let me zoom into that area where I just pointed to and see if there's a town nearby. And there's a little town there called Oak Ridge. 
And if we trace Highway 58 back east out to Highway 97, it doesn't look like there's very much in between. So let's just use the town of Oak Ridge as our starting point for the PCOR. So let's go back to Google Maps and see what we can find for gas stations. Okay, there's quite a few in Oak Ridge. And there's also one in between Highway 97 and Oak Ridge. So what else did we have there? I think we had one like near the junction. Yeah, we've got a couple around the junction. So let's take that one gas station that's on Highway 58, just in case we need to use it and mark it. So that's a, looks like a Sinclair gas station. So we'll do the same thing as earlier. We'll get the GPS coordinates near there and we'll drop a waypoint into Gaia. So I'm going to keep looking for gas stations, grocery stores, propane tank exchange locations, and of course potential dispersed campsites along the PCOR. We're also going to mark one or two paid campsite options as an all else fails kind of a backup. So what about planning for trip segments? Like on this day we're going to drive X distance to this area to camp for the night. Personally, I have a general idea of where the next camp area is going to be for the next evening but I always mark several options in case something prevents us from getting that far or maybe we find that we can get even further down the trail than planned. But I don't set rigid plans anymore because I find that it just drives me crazy and the people around me crazy. But if it works for you, do it. Tip number nine, download map data so you actually have access to it while you're offline. If you don't download your map data, you're just gonna have a blank map with no info when you're offline. Right now I have airplane mode on and my Wi-Fi turned off to show you what I'm talking about. Let's zoom in to Washington DC and you've got nothing, right? No data at all. Like other than like what towns are in proximity to it, that's all you get. I mean, that's pretty useless overall, right? As a side note, you can download maps before marking all of your waypoints and importing tracks and all that stuff. All of those are separate types of data. So think of them all like layers in a sense. Gaia calls tracks, waypoints and other things overlays. So if I turn my Wi-Fi back on and turn off airplane mode, you'll see a big difference in the map almost immediately. There you go. Look at all that information we were missing because we were offline and didn't have any downloaded map data. So let me show you how to download map data. And I've never downloaded anything for the state of Montana, so let's use that as our example. So what I'm going to do first is to check that I have all the layers that I want selected and I'm gonna rearrange them just because I'm OCD about that stuff. And then I'm gonna hit the plus icon again and then click download maps. You see a bunch of existing red boxes and that's all the map data I currently have downloaded. And we see our box that we can move around by using the blue corners. And that is going to allow us to create the shape of the map that we wanna save right now. So I'm going to do the best I can to fit Montana into as small of a box as I can by moving the little blue dots around with my finger. And that looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save in the top right and then make sure I have all the layers that I want selected. And it's really just Gaia Overland and Cell Coverage Verizon because the fire overlays, you need actual signal to pull new data. Makes sense, right? So I'm gonna hit next and give this map a name and we're just gonna call it Montana, if I can spell. Now we'll hit save up in the top right and it'll start downloading and do its own thing. Once it finishes downloading all the map data, what you can do if you're like me and you wanna measure twice and cut once is to turn off your Wi-Fi Put your phone in airplane mode, that way you have no signal, and then double check that the map data you downloaded is in fact there. One thing I recommend doing periodically is under the settings tab. So hit settings and then we're going to hit map downloads. And you see where it says last integrity check? That's where Gaia last checked all the map data integrity. So if you click that, it'll do it manually for you. I just do that before every trip. If you're running out of storage space on your phone, you can delete map data that you're not using. And let me show you how to do that. So we're gonna go to the saved items folder and then we're gonna filter it by just maps. So these are all the maps I've stored on my phone right now. And to delete one, you just hit that little icon in the top right of each map. It's like a circle with three dots in it. 
and just hit delete. That'll remove all the data for that map and free up some space for you. So that's your basic navigation and lay of the land kind of planning, but we're not done yet. You probably have an idea of when you want to go on your trip or you have very specific dates to take your trip. But before you set firm dates, let's cover tip number 10, check the weather and check for wildfire information. Fire season is nearly year round nowadays in some areas of the country, particularly on the West Coast, but there are still drier months when you typically see an increase in number of fires and an increase in the severity of fires. That's not to say don't plan trips during fire season. It just means you have to be more vigilant in looking up wildfire information before your trip and during your trip. But bro dude, how do I check for that when I'm off grid and I don't have signal, yo? Use your eyes and your nose. If you can see smoke way up in the sky or you smell smoke, be on high alert. Always have a good idea where your exit routes are, just in case you need to get out of an area super quickly. And if you're gonna be on like a super narrow trail, remember where the turnaround spots are, again, just in case you need to get out of somewhere quickly. Gaia has a pretty useful map layer called Wildfires Current and Wildfires Satellite Detection. Those layers do require connectivity to update, so be smart about using them. Obviously, you can't download that data with your maps because it needs to update frequently. One map layer that I always include with map data downloads is Cell Coverage Verizon. There's also one called Cell Coverage All Carriers. That map layer will give you a pretty decent idea of where you can get enough signal strength for internet connectivity to check for fire info or whatever else. It also has different shading that shows you 3G, 4G, and LTE coverage. Along with wildfire information, check the weather repeatedly when you do have signal. Forecasts change all the time. And knowing the weather before you leave on the trip can really help you determine like what gear you need to pack and what gear you can leave behind. Maybe I won't bother packing my waterproof boots if there's no rain expected. Or maybe I need to pack my cold weather sleeping bag instead of my summer bag because of the forecasted temperature. When you're checking the weather, you're probably not going to find a forecast for the middle of nowhere. So use the location closest to where you're gonna be that does have a forecast and use the following general rule of thumb. For every thousand feet of elevation you gain, the temperature drops by about 5.4 degrees. So if you're checking the weather and you see that that location says 50 degrees and the elevation there's roughly 2000 feet and you're planning to camp at 7,000 feet, well, you're looking at roughly 23 degrees where you're gonna be camping. Okay, next up is tip number 11. Check for road closure information. Inclement weather and wildfires can definitely derail trip plans. So can road closures. Road closure information can be spotty at times, particularly in the backcountry. But we'll check what we can using the Forest Service website for the national forests that you're going to be in, and the National Park website if applicable. The Bureau of Land Management website also has road closure information for their areas. Also, don't forget to check regular roads and highways and I generally look at the Department of Transportation's website for that. Obviously, you want to do all that as your trip approaches for the latest info available. Don't forget to bookmark all of these websites in your smartphone browser so that you have quick access to these resources when you have signal to check stuff. Let's talk about some things you may not think of if you haven't been camping in a while or you're just entirely new to this. Tip number 12, give consideration to what kind of wildlife there's gonna be in the areas that you're gonna be going to. For this trip, I have to consider that we may encounter bears and mountain lions and coyotes and even wolves. Wolf packs have been seen in many parts of Oregon. But if you're gonna be going to desert environments, then you gotta think about rattlesnakes and scorpions and poison spiders and that sort of thing. Pack the appropriate gear in case you need to deal with those kind of wildlife situations. And it doesn't even have to be a life-threatening situation. What about mosquitoes? Mosquitoes are super annoying. I don't think anybody likes them. And you don't want to be going to an area that are known to have a lot of mosquitoes and not be prepared for that. So I'll leave links for all that kind of stuff down in the video description below. I probably wouldn't bother bringing bear spray if I'm going to the Mojave Desert. And maybe I think about bringing a snake bite kit instead. And no, not your favorite hard cider and lager. Well, that snake bite libation kit might actually be more useful overall after reading an article on what actually to do to treat a snake bite. I'll let you read that article on your own, link down below. I also put links for what to do for scorpion stings and spider bites as well. It's good to refresh your knowledge on that stuff every now and then, just so you know what items you might want to add to your first aid kit. And I know I say this a lot, but if you don't have a good first aid kit, that's really not the place you should be skimping out on. Also, in a previous video, I talked about the odor-proof container that I use for trash to help counter curious bears. Well, a couple of viewers commented that if a bear wants to get into that container, they will. I agree. It's not foolproof, but it's an extra layer of precaution. The best precaution you can take is to store your trash and or bear-proof food containers at least a couple hundred feet away from camp. Otherwise, you might wake up to this.
The next tip might be useful to some of you out there that carry way too much gear and way too much weight on their rig. Like my poor foreigner that feels like it's eating Thanksgiving dinner every single day. So tip number 13, reduce liquid weight when you can. If you know you'll be able to easily find gas on the way to your destination and there aren't any real long stretches of road where there's no gas stations, well, maybe you don't fill that five gallon jerry can up before you get to your destination. I mean, that right there saves you about 30 pounds in just gasoline. Or maybe you don't fill up your water containers all the way until you get closer to your destination because five gallons of water weighs almost 42 pounds. I know I have a tendency to want to bring everything in the kitchen sink, but reducing weight where you can is a good practice. Tip number 14, and it's one that I constantly talk about. If you're going to be going off grid, have an emergency satellite communication device. I don't care which one you get. They're all good. Just get one. Seriously, how often have you seen on the news about somebody who got lost hiking and was never found? Or somebody who just vanished in the thin air while they were camping in the woods? A sat comms device can save your life or the life of your travel companion. So get one if you don't have one. And frankly, I don't wanna see any of you guys on the news, ever. And my very last tip, number 15. Use the overlanding community to help you. Whether it's trip planning questions, gear related topics, vehicle stuff, or you just want to meet other people that like doing stuff. There's some great online communities where you can learn more about overlanding and meet other overlanders. I started a Facebook group and it's just me in there right now and it feels like I need to paint like a face on a volleyball to hang out with me or something. But you guys can use that if you want. And I'll put a link for that down in the video description and there's a link up in that banner at the top of my channel too. Okay, let's review all 15 tips. Tip number one, if you're planning your first overlanding adventure, don't plan some crazy two week long adventure. Keep it short and relatively local. Tip number two, don't plan overly long drives. Driving for like 12 hours sucks and it'll probably make everything less enjoyable. Tip number three, know where you can refuel, not just on the long highway drives, but especially while you're out adventuring in the backcountry. Tip number four, Download Gaia GPS or Onyx Off-Road or whatever offline map app you're comfortable with. Paper maps are a good backup to have too. Basically, just have a way to navigate without cell phone service. Tip number five, use multiple resources for camping information. Tip number six, create waypoints for resupply locations like gas stations, grocery stores, water sources, propane exchange and refill locations, and of course, campsites. Tip number seven, mark waypoints for the places that you want to see. Maybe you won't get to all of them, but have an idea of the things you want to see. Tip number eight, look for backcountry routes that have already been mapped out by others and use that info to help you plan an epic adventure. Tip number nine, download map data so you have access to that info when you're offline. Tip number 10, check the weather, check the weather, and oh yeah, check the weather. Also, check for wildfire information. Tip number 11, check for road closure information. Tip number 12, give consideration to what kind of wildlife there's gonna be in the area that you're going to and prepare accordingly. Tip number 13, reduce liquid weight when you can. Tip number 14, if you're going off grid, have an emergency satellite communication device. And lastly, tip number 15, Use the overlanding community to help you. Once again, links for everything are down in the video description below. I'm not sponsored by anyone, but some of those links are affiliate links. So I do appreciate you guys using those when you can. Did I miss anything? Or did I just say something that's completely wrong? Let me know in the comments down below so that I can update everybody in a future video. In a previous video, I mentioned that I feel a lot less chilly sleeping up in my rooftop tent versus down in a ground tent. And I'm telling you all this because I did a little bit more research and found something that should have been pretty obvious, which is that ground temperature can be higher than air temperature. And that's because air temperature changes so rapidly, right? Makes a lot of sense. But being where I live and the fact that I don't have that much winter camping experience, it just wasn't something I thought about. But it's a good thing I already have a mattress that has a high R value rating. So why am I telling you this again? Because I'd rather give you guys good information than just think that I'm right all the time. Because I am definitely not right all the time. Just ask the boss. What, what, what? A huge, huge thank you to all of you who've joined me on this journey so far. Your fantastic input, your positive vibes, and the general sense of community that you've shown me is overwhelming. Many, many warm fuzzies right here. 
If you found this video helpful or entertaining, please hit that subscribe button up here and then watch this video down here. And hook me up by sharing the video with a friend and hitting that thumbs up. That'll do it. I hope you guys will join me next time. Hit that bell icon if you want to be notified for future videos. Always remember, destinations don't matter, the journey matters. This is Roger, over.